Hello and welcome back to Witch Fix. I'm going to be looking at today another book which weirdly sounds like a non-fiction book but is actually a novel. So the previous one that I looked at was Love Potions and I wasn't exactly enamoured with that book. It's still sitting in the car boot pile because the weather has been so atrocious we haven't had a chance to get rid of it. Uh, and every time I see it in the hallway I'm like, you, you know what you did. But while I was actually reading that I went to meet a friend for lunch and I arrived like two hours early because I'm quite a nervous driver and I like to get places super early uh, and I was going around all the charity shops because I love them and in the four books for a pound box outside of Oxfam bookshop I found another book called Garden Spells and obviously I was drawn to the word spells because I was like aha that's gonna be about magic and it was actually about magic when I read the blurb so I purchased it um, and I've been trying to read it for the last like two weeks because I think love potions just kind of turn me off reading for a bit. You know when you read like a bad book and you're like not ready to trust again? That that That's how I felt. By the way, if you could hear a, a hardcore whirring sound, it's my Xbox struggling to install Mass Effect Andromeda. So I'm multitasking, just ignore it. So the blurb on the back of this book, which is Garden Spells by Sarah Addison Allen, is Welcome to Bascom, North Carolina, where it seems that everyone has a story to tell about the Waverly Women, the house that's been in the family for generations, the walled garden that mysteriously blooms year round, the rumours of dangerous loves and tragic passions. Every Waverly woman is somehow touched by magic. Claire has always clung to the Waverly's roots, tending the enchanted soil in the family garden from which she makes her sought after delicacies, famed and feared for their curious effects. She has everything she thinks she needs, until one day she wakes to find a stranger has moved in next door, and a vine of ivy has crept into her garden. Claire's carefully tended life is about to run gloriously out of control. Curiously, the blurb doesn't actually mention the other protagonist of the novel, which is Claire's sister Sydney, or half-sister, because they have different fathers. But Sydney's story does like come into things after the first couple of chapters, and that's really where I started to become more interested in the book, because that's when the book turned into practical magic. Um, that's Practical Magic the movie. Uh, you might remember that I reviewed the novel Practical Magic by Alice Hoffman, and I thought it was okay, but obviously it was nothing like the film, which I really love. So that kind of put me off it a little bit, even though I knew going into it that it wasn't going to be a lot like the film. I was kind of staggered by how not like it it was. This book might as well be a novelization of the Practical Magic movie. There are some differences, which I'll go into in a minute, but also a fuck ton of similarities. Because of its similarity to Practical Magic, I'm going to have to give a warning for um, abuse, um, spousal abuse, and also rape as well. So that's going to be mentioned in the plot line. It's going to be mentioned by me as I discuss that plot line, and it's in the book as well. So it's not too graphic, so you could get past it if the mention of it wouldn't upset you, but be warned it's in there. So the first part of the book we meet Claire. Claire is a chef or a caterer. Um, she works from home um, which she's recently inherited from her grandmother who raised her after her mum kind of ran out on her and her younger sister and left them there and then died in a car accident. So she makes all these like magic meals for people which kind of reminded me of that bit in Practical Magic where they put the potion in like the pancake syrup to make the policeman go away. Basically that, she makes a lot of things with, like flower petals in and uh, lots of different kind of things with herbs and stuff as well. Now she's quite perfectly ordered in her life, she doesn't have a lot of time for you know love or passion, she's very devoted to her work, uh, her family, her small town and in that way is extremely like Sandra Bullock's character from the movie. Then Sydney rocks up Sydney followed in their mum's wandering itinerant footsteps. She went all over the place before she got pregnant by not a very nice man who I don't think she actually married. Maybe she did marry him. I can't remember. But was he was like a long term partner. Uh, she got pregnant by him and then stayed with him. But he became progressively more and more abusive to the extent that while he's out of town, he has a neighbour woman spy on them. To see if they go anywhere that he says that they shouldn't go so they have to orchestrate their escape quite carefully uh, they do escape they go back to obviously bascom and they rock up at claire's house sydney and her daughter bay and they don't really tell claire everything about why they're running away they just kind of say that they're there to visit or maybe to stay for a bit and it's all a bit tense and weird and again lots of practical magic vibes the neighbour who's moved in next door is a guy who teaches art at the college. He's 
Claire's principal love interest throughout the novel. That was probably the least interesting part of the story for me because it was really familiar from a lot of other chiclet books. You know, like, oh, I want him, but I'm worried he's going to leave or I'm not ready to give my heart to somebody. It takes up a lot of the book, which I would have preferred to have been taken up by more magic stuff. The actual magic stuff in the book is quite interesting. The most magical thing I think that's mentioned is the apple tree in the garden. It has a kind of personality and it's talked about as if it is like a character. It throws apples at people, it kind of gets them into people's rooms somehow from the garden and even manages to get some next door to Tyler. And the apples are magical in that if you eat one it will show you the most important moment of your life. And it's sort of Claire's job as the Waverley in residence to gather up all the apples and bury them because no one should be allowed to eat one and she knows that none of the Waverley should eat them either. It's like a, a thing that she has to protect people from so she's just burying them all. And the tree's not very happy about this and it kind of keeps dropping them on her head and like at one point it tries to tip over a picnic table so that's quite humorous and fun. Claire's also described as having like magical effects on things around her like when she's frustrated she leaves a burning handprint on the door frame. She causes um, fog I think at one point because she's like really hot for the next door neighbour and then she takes a shower and it creates like a mist that fills up the streets all around their house. So various like magically things like that. I found Sydney to be the more interesting character because it seemed like Claire wasn't really doing much except getting in her own way. She didn't really have any reason to have these issues that were preventing her from committing to Tyler so I wasn't particularly interested in her. Sydney had a lot going on um, internally a lot of like character building and so I enjoyed her a lot more. The most like character building moments of her were her getting work at a local salon and people not wanting to have their hair cut by her because she used to be going out with this rich guy in town who dumped her on the last day of high school because she was just you know like a poor townie that he was having a fling with and he thought she should have known that he couldn't like build a future with her because he had to marry someone who was like equally important and rich which is a dick move you also get like different people's perspective throughout the novel and that's how we get into the head of that guy's wife emma i didn't really enjoy emma very much like by the end of the book she was okay but right at the start it, it kind of felt a little bit slut shamey because the waverleys have like their magic and they all have individual powers that I'll get into in a second. But Emma's family, the Clarks, they also have their own kind of magic, which is sex. And it's sort of described as like all Clark women are really good at sex. They use it to like get what they want. And they've always landed like the best men and managed to keep their men and all that stuff. But it's kind of described in this way that kind of looks down on Emma for being all like relying on sex to keep her husband. Now she does do things that are undeniably despicable, like the way that she finally gets her husband to like forget about Sydney when he's younger is to tamper with her birth control so she gets pregnant, which is gross. But I feel like the book didn't really want us to hate her for that reason. It wanted us to hate her because she was having a lot of sex in high school, like honing her skills to land the right guy, whereas Sydney was a virgin. And it kind of felt a little bit judgmental and horrible, which I wasn't really here for, considering the book was published in, like, 2007. Feels like it's suitably modern that we shouldn't be hearing that sort of stuff. But I moved past it because Emma as a character kind of developed a bit more, and it felt like we were kind of leaving that judgment behind us. Now, all of the Wave Leaves have separate powers. Uh, for example, Sydney's power that she discovers is that she can tell everything about a person by their hair. And this is, I think, linked to her interest in being a hairdresser or beautician. She can kind of interpret these things about people just from the way their hair looks. And she can cut their hair in a way that is perfectly suited to them and makes them look amazing, which is obviously fantastic for her business. Claire's powers run to the more culinary um, herb area. Um, which I've already described. Bay, because she's also a Waverly, because she's Sydney's daughter, she has the power to know instinctively where things belong, which on one level means that she can come into Claire's kitchen and instantly know where everything should be kept. She also um, knows that her and her mother don't belong with her father. They belong somewhere else. So she can tell where people belong. And at one point in the novel, you also find out that she is using her power because her father is so changeable and so mentally fucked up. That's basically the only way I can explain it. 
that he will come home and say that his socks should be in his shoes in the closet instead of in his sock drawer and then he'll like beat Sydney because they're in the wrong place and somehow that's her fault so Bay is trying to interpret these lightning fast changes in his preferences to reorder the house to try and prevent that from happening which is really sad and quite horrible the person who had the power that I liked the most was Evanel I think she's like a great aunt or a cousin an elderly cousin of the family uh, she doesn't live with the rest of them in the house she lives in town but she's an old lady and she has a power that sometimes she has to give people things like she will cross town in the middle of the night uh, she does at the beginning of the book she crosses town in the middle of the night to go to Claire's to give her a box of strawberry pop tarts and two new sets of sheets because she can't sleep until she's given them to her and when Bay and Sydney turn up obviously they need new sheets and Bay's favorite food is strawberry pop tarts so it's things like that um she has like a massive store of stuff in her house just random junk in case people need it and she has a massive tote bag that she carries around with her with lots of odds and ends in because she sometimes just needs to give people stuff and I found that really interesting um especially because it foreshadows a lot of things uh, at one point she turns up and gives Bay a crystal brooch that sort of becomes important in the plot later and she also gives Emma two quarters which again becomes important in the plot later when Sydney first shows up she gives her a blouse that she felt like she had to buy her from a posh clothing shop but she felt she had to buy it several sizes too big and when Sydney returns it to the store she sees across the street the salon where she can then work so it's like that kind of thing it kind of shapes the plot hers was the power I found most interesting in terms of the writing it reminded me a bit of Chocolat it was very sensual it was about of like flavors scents sights sounds really immersive in that way very poetic I will say that I felt like it was slightly over long and it barely pushes like 300 pages it's like I think 280 something but it felt like a lot of the pageation was given to the wrong things like a lot of it was dwelling on Claire and Tyler or Sydney and her eventual love interest and a lot of it focuses on this dream that Bay has where she's happy and she can hear like paper flapping and see like sparkles in the air and she keeps trying to recreate this dream because she knows that when she does she'll be truly happy but she can't quite manage it and it felt like that wasn't hugely important but the book kept going on and on and on about it and it was kind of annoying um whereas obviously david i think his name is like the the nasty partner um uh, from sydney's past when he eventually shows up which obviously he does because that's how conflict works he's gotten rid of fairly quickly and nothing really bad happens it happens in like three pages and i felt like with all the effort that had been put into building Sydney's confidence as a Waverly, as someone who has these powers, it, it could have been handled in a way that was more dramatic, that took up more of the book and that felt more important and gave more weight to the ending. Whereas it just kind of, he turns up and is quickly like removed from the scene, which isn't particularly satisfying to me as a reader. I would have wanted maybe a bit more of a confrontation, but it was like semi-satisfying let's put it that way there are also other people's stories kind of woven into the book the main one is uh, emma's story she's kind of like paranoid that her husband's gonna leave her now that sydney's back not particularly interesting but she proves a kind of nice middle of the book antagonist before the you know evil abusive partner can show up so i kind of get why she's there and there's an older guy who is in a gay relationship whose partner has just split from him after quite a long time because he's not very driven, he's not very decisive, he kind of doesn't really decide anything in his own life. He ends up moving in with Evanel for a bit and they have a nice friendship which feels really nice and kind of cosy. I did kind of hope that um, there's a guy, Henry, whose family apparently all the men marry like older women. Like a lot of the families in this book, they have their own... I wouldn't describe it as a magic but their own kind of habits and history like law uh, like the Clarks being really good at sex and this guy's family being like drawn to older women because they're all sort of born as old men they're never really like young at heart but I kind of thought he was going to end up with the gay guy because he was like older than him and it seemed like that was the way it was going but that doesn't happen I kind of question why that guy's story was there although obviously it was nice to have a little bit of representation even if 
the book was basically all just white people. There is a sequel to this book out at the moment called First Frost. I have to say I don't know how interested I would be in going back to these characters um, because I feel like their story's kind of over and anything else would just be a bit annoying and boring and kind of eking it out. But there is another book which seems to be similar which I have purchased because it was like £1.20 on eBay um, and I just finished this one and there was an extract at the end which I did not read but um, on the first page of the extract it says if you liked garden spells read on for a tale of love candy and magic that is sure to bewitch even the most skeptical reader and it's called the sugar queen and it says it came out in august 2008 so it's quite an old one but i thought i like candy and magic so i'll look into this and purchase it it also seemed to have a plot which included more elements that were more interesting to me so this is the blurb for that book 27 year old Josie is sure of three things winter in her North Carolina hometown is her favorite season she's a sorry excuse for a southern belle and sweets are best eaten in the privacy of her hidden closet for a while Josie has settled into her uneventful life in her mother's house her one consolation is the stockpile of sugary treats and paperback romances she escapes to each night until she finds her closet harboring none other than local waitress Della Lee Baker, a tough-talking, tender-hearted woman who is one part nemesis and two parts fairy godmother. So I kind of like the idea of that because this is not going to reflect well on me, but the main character seems like kind of a sad sack who's like stuck in her own shell. And I very much feel like that a lot of the time, so... I kind of relate more to that than to a successful business owner who like lives in her own house and is like sport of a choice with lovers. I also like the idea that the relationship between two women seems to be like front and center. Even if it's not going to be like a lesbian book, it might still have like a good relationship between two women, which is more interesting to me than just reading like more straight romance done by like formula. Um, and weirdly, winter. I, I like the idea of it being set in winter. It seems like it's going to be quite cosy. And the weather around here is, while well, not cold, very wet and gross. So I could use a nice cosy read to cuddle up with, as it were. So I'm going to be giving that a read later um, when it arrives. And hopefully it will be as good as Garden Spells or better. Because I really did enjoy Garden Spells. It is a lot like Practical Magic in many ways. And that's why I liked it. Obviously there's new elements to the story and I don't think the author ripped off practical magic of a movie but again the plot very similar the characters also kind of similar but they do stand out and kind of hold their own to the extent where I'm not like referring to them as the names of the practical magic characters in my head because they have enough character of their own so I definitely recommend checking this one out it has a cover price of 6 99 but I mean I found it in a one pound bargain bin you can probably find it online the kindle edition is 2 99 which is a really good price for a professionally edited like actually published by an actual publisher book and it's published by Hodder which I've heard of um like I would expect to be paying that much for like a self-published ebook that was of reasonable quality so definitely a good price add that to your kindle or get the kindle app for your phone if you're not like keen on buying a whole kindle or you can yeah just buy the paperback but if you're like me and rapidly running out of book space, your Kindle's your best bet. Uh, so I'm excited to have found another sort of short series of books that are like magical realism, because I feel like I'm running out of series. Series? One of the two. If you have any ideas of like other series that you'd like to see me review or look at or just read in general and comment on, uh, do let me know. You can do so using Twitter or the email address. You can also comment on my Instagram, which is at Jolly Snidge. Um, and also there you can see just random pictures of me being stupid if that's your cup of tea all the details for that are in the description box beneath where you are listening to this episode currently and i'll see you in the next one bye